something I don't talk about very often is koans. Um, I didn't come up in a koan system. My lineage didn't uh, have that kind of practice. And so I'm not, I was never steeped in them. But of course, we're all steeped in them. We're all immersed in them to a degree because we're Zen practitioners. The, they inform our practice. If we, if we go reading anything about Zen, we bump into these koans. And so we kind of develop a relationship to them, whether we're you know, taking them up as a practice or not. And we get favorites, you know. And favorites are sometimes the ones that uh, are funny. Sometimes they're the ones that we just don't get, but they, they stick in our minds. Or sometimes they're ones that, uh, that feel like they have some, some hint of inspiration buried within them, even if they don't make perfect sense on the surface. And today I wanted to share a favorite and it's, it's in category three. It has a little bit of, of inspiration inside it. So here it is. It's really simple. Uh, and, and I think like most of the best koans, it doesn't end with a question. It's, it just, it just says, watch this for a minute. Zuigan Gen Osho. Osho means preceptor. So that's just the title you hear for everybody. Zuigan Gen Osho called to himself every day, master. And then he answered to himself, yes. Then he would say, be wide awake. And he would answer, yes. And then he would say, from now on, never be deceived by others. And he would respond, no, I won't. That's it. It's great. Years ago, I heard of a community where they actually incorporate this into the service as a call and response. So the left half of the room says, master, and the other side says, yes. And then they, they says, be wide awake and you say, yes, like that. And then you switch so that everybody gets to play. I think it's wonderful, terrible on Zoom, but it would be great in person. It would be it would be it would be really, really nice. So we have this scene and there's no context. So, you know, is this something he did when he woke up in the morning and he's still you know lying in bed? Is this something he's, you know, in, in uh, modern times, we might imagine standing in the bathroom and looking at the mirror and you know you finish brushing your teeth and then you say master yes or what you know what what was this for him i don't know but we're told that he he did this every day he had this same conversation with himself every day i love it there are two sides right and I'll, I'll go ahead and read this. So this is in the Gateless Gate, the Mumonkan or the Wu Mengguan. Uh, it's a collection of koans. This is case 12. And the way that these collections work is the, they have the koan and then they have a comment by Mumon or Wu Men, who was the compiler of this, and then a verse. And I'm going to read the comment. This is the, this is the commentary on that koan. Old Zuigan buys and sells himself. He takes out a lot of God masks and devil masks and puts them on and plays with them. What for? One calling and the other answering, one wide awake, the other saying he will never be deceived. If you stick to any of them, you'll be a failure. If you imitate Zuigan, you'll play the fox. So Mumum is pointing out the obvious part of this, which is that, that, that uh, Zuigan is he's playing two characters, right? And he calls this buying and selling himself, wearing God masks and devil masks. In uh, other Zen language, we might say he's playing guest and he's playing host at the same time, right? I think one of the things that, that we naturally look at if we're going to work with this koan, if we're going to carry this around, is to ask ourselves where we identify in this. Right? And I think that what might be the case 
for a lot of people, I'm guessing, is that we imagine ourselves as the student who is calling out to the teacher, right? We're calling out to some version of ourselves that maybe is a little further along the path or that that understands something more easily and we're 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 kind of reaching for that in this and that's true but i think that in order to understand what this conversation is we have to be able to imagine being the other person we have to imagine being the person you're brushing your teeth and then suddenly you're called upon as the teacher. Can you identify with that? Can you be both? I think you all know from listening to me talk that I have a kind of fascination or a, with with the part of us that knows. I like to think about the part of us that knows. I think there's a part of us that understands the precepts, for example, without knowing the precepts. There's a part of us that understands the bodhisattva vows without knowing the vows. I believe that there's, we can call that intuition, we can call that something else. I think that we, there's a lot about this practice where the, the Zen part is just language that we're attaching to something that we already get, but maybe don't look at all the time and maybe don't know how to articulate. So we allow the tradition to kind of articulate it for us. And if we're looking at that in terms of this koan, we might imagine that that's the master. Right? There's a part of us that, that gets this already. And so the part of us that doesn't get it is going to call on that version, right? We're going to tap into that part of our mind. But what's beautiful about it is that, is that the student is saying what to do. The student is telling the master what needs to be upheld. So there really isn't someone who knows and someone who doesn't know. Zuigan says, master, and then he says, yes, right, I'm listening. And then he says, be wide awake. And Zuigan, the master says, yes. Okay. Then he says, from now on, never be deceived by others. And he says, no, I won't. It's this promise to himself. And it isn't clear which self knows better. I love it. I think there's a danger if we explore this idea of knowing, there's a danger in resting in it too much, right? It can become complacent. Once we start to identify those elements of ourselves that, that have a certain spiritual confidence, which we should, which I hope we do, something can kind of trickle in that feels like, yeah, I get this. I, I know, I know what I'm doing. So we bring in this other part, this other part that essentially is slapping us in the face, saying, hey, wake up. I know you know about being awake, but do it now. Hey, don't be deceived. So, okay, okay, okay. 
Right. Right. Last week we were talking about social media. If everyone here, before they logged on to any social media, had this dialogue with themselves, it would be different. It's different before you log on to Facebook to say to yourself, be awake, don't be deceived. And then to promise to yourself, yeah, yeah, okay. I will do that. I can do that. I understand what that is. There's such a beautiful confidence in this story. And there's also such a beautiful vulnerability in this story. Zuigan knows what he needs to do. He knows that he's capable of doing it. And he also knows he could slip. And so he's looking himself in the eye every day. And for you, it might not be this exactly. And Mumon even says, don't imitate Zuigong. Don't just parrot this. It isn't for us to look in the mirror and say, be wide awake, don't be deceived by others. What it is for us to do is to look in the mirror and tell ourselves to do or to not do the thing that we know is hard and that must be done. And there's nothing in this tradition that is going to tell you exactly what that is. It's not going to put words in your mouth. You're putting the words in your mouth and then you're putting the response in your mouth. When I was younger, I used to write up uh, gattas, little verses that people would say before they eat or before you wash dishes or before you brush your teeth or whatever. I made them, I laminated them, and I put them all over the house. I loved that. I should go back to doing that. But whenever I turned on the light, I saw it. Whenever I brushed my teeth, I saw it. I memorized them. That's one way to practice. This is related to that. This isn't a heart to heart. This isn't an assessment. It isn't waking up every day and looking in the mirror and saying, where, I am, where am I now? Zuigan did that. He figured out where he was. He figured out what he needs. And then he decided, this is what I'm gonna need forever. I'm gonna tell myself this same thing every day single day. It is demanding. And it's encouraging. Because he trusts that face in the mirror to say yes. So what we're left with sounds simple, but it's not. Is the question, what do you need to hear from yourself? What do I need to hear from myself? To understand that both in terms of my strengths and my weaknesses, and then having established what it is, honestly, maybe painfully, to actually say it to myself. And then not just to say it, but to insist on an agreement in response. 
there's something very different about saying be wide awake and saying be wide awake and then pausing and saying yes <laughs> so i'll leave it there we're all stuck with this we're all holding this we all get to have this question Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you're brushing your teeth and you're looking yourself in the eye, start to ask yourself this question. Right? Ask yourself for a while. You might settle on something. You might find that there's a conversation that you need to have and that you can have every day. And if you do, than koan's work how great is that i'll stop there <laughs>